Kate Stewart from Colorado Parks and Wildlife, and Marcella Fremgen from the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. Uh, both here that, yeah, give them a hand. They've spent a lot of time um, digging up some of these great successes and putting it together into a, a, a slideshow. So I'm going to turn it over to them and enjoy. And, and don't forget to just uh, take time to suck this in. There's been a lot of things going on, uh, happening on the ground, a lot of successes. So here we go. Thank you very much, everyone. I apologize for intruding on our happy hour here. Um, I kind of feel like I lost a bet or something with Pat because I initially agreed to do this, but maybe I wasn't paying attention on the phone. And I thought we were just going to be doing a slideshow that was going to circle through and just have a lot of pretty pictures. And uh, then he said, No, 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 you got to narrate. Okay? And, Wait a minute, that changes everything. So what well, Marcella's going to do. And, Hello. Okay, Marcella's great to work with. I can do this. Can't we just I think we've come up with a real nice presentation. Fortunately, we've seen all these photos and projects already. Um, it's a real piece of redundancy, but uh, I want to thank Marcella for helping me get this, this presentation together. She really is more of an artist, so all the nice pretty slides, uh, some of the ugly numbers, especially with the CCA, that, that's my contribution. So, um, so thank you, Marcella, for helping me. That's right, it's, it, this is by no means a comprehensive slideshow, but we really wanted to just bring up some of the larger projects, really celebrate celebrate the diversity and uh, abundance of different projects and conservation uh, activities we've been doing range-wide for nice and sage grouse uh, really over the past 20 years or so so thank you So as you can see, just numerous different partners have been involved in this. And again, uh, I'm sure I'm missing someone. I apologize in advance. So again, starting back in the 90s, uh, 1995 uh, is really when the Gunnison Basin Local Working Group was established. The very first conservation plan was developed here in Gunnison Basin in 1997. And that really helped facilitate the other conservation plans for these outlying populations. Uh, San Miguel Basin, Crawford, and Dove Creek all put out conservation plans in 1998. And then Pena Mesa, Poncha Pass, and Monticello, Utah, they put out conservation plans in 2000, 2003. Uh, as you can see, the Range Wide Conservation Plan, kind of our overarching document that came out in 2005. There's just a tremendous number of people that have been involved in putting these, these local conservation plans together in the Range Wide Conservation Plan. Uh, thank you for, the, I say, the old timers' work. So, Dr. Jerry Hub, Dr. Clayton Braun, uh, they found out that the body size differed quite a bit between sage grouse here in the Gunnison Basin and outside the basin. Uh, this is their 1991 publication, Geographic Variation on Sage Grouse in Colorado. And that led to additional research led by Dr. Jessica Young for her PhD. Uh, publication came out in 2000, which really, it was groundbreaking work. I mean, this is, this is the first publication that said we have a new species of bird in North America, the Gunnison sage grouse. Uh, Dr. Jessica Young, by the way, was awarded the Edwards Prize for the best major article that year in the Wilson Bulletin. And, uh, and again, the American Ornithology Union recognized the Gunnison sage grouse as a separate species that year. 
So that research led to obviously more questions, facilitated more research on use. That started a 12 year endeavor by the National Park Service out here at the Curry County Recreation Area. Uh, Jessica, um, Jessica Frey uh, and Brooke Vasquez, two friends of mine that have still uh, continued to be involved with some of the night trapping events and sage grouse, just did an excellent job of uh, trapping these birds at night and getting a great sample size on the air so that we could look at habitat use and graphics and all that survival. So again, 12 year study, looking at adult female survival, nest success, chick survival, and habitat use. Some of this was presented uh, yesterday by Dr. Cameron Aldridge. A few more nice photos. So again, more research. This was actually conducted by Leif Weichmann, uh, our captive rearing project. You heard some of this yesterday. Again, and this really answered some of those questions on how do you actually keep gus and sage grouse in captivity? How do we keep them alive? Are we need to watch a wildlife site? Is there a public viewing site here in Gunnison? Over 3,200 visitors have come and visited this site from 44 different states, 18 different countries. And that doesn't include the number of volunteers that have come out and worked the site. So uh, this has been a project or uh, the viewing site is, is under easement with Colorado Parks and Wildlife, but it's actually managed by Siskiyou and the Western State Colorado University. Uh, it's been monitored for the past 15 years. Over 145 students have volunteered their time 3,750 hours contributed. So leading into some of Colorado Parks and Wildlife research, we've been obviously coordinating LEX. Um, you've heard about the traffic transplant program numerous times, candidate conservation agreement with assurances, conservation easements, and some of the habitat improvement projects. So LEC monitoring. <coughs> Every spring, Colorado Parks and Wildlife we coordinate our lek count effort. We monitor 82 different leks here in the Madison Basin. Roughly 50 some volunteers from different agencies contribute their early mornings. So, this is a, a male on a rock. <laughs> What I like is that you can see, see his breath every time he moves. Testament of just how cold it is out there. <laughs> so trap and transplant, uh, I won't go through all the numbers, but 367 birds have now been trapped and relocated to these outlying populations. Uh, again, we heard a great DNA analysis from Dr. Sarah Oiler McCants and also PhD candidate Shauna Zimmerman. So, each population, uh, again, every bird has a VHF transmitter on it so that we can monitor the movements and survival. This is a past technician of mine, Kristen Barker. We're, we're over in the Crawford population trying to recover mortality. Clayton Bondrant, Kristen on the bottom, uh, fellow biologist Evan Phillips out of Montrose. Again, recovering transmitters and putting transmitters out. This was a pretty neat idea. Uh, Missy Siders and Ken Holsinger, again in the Crawford population, they decided to put out a few game cameras to see what kind of animals are showing up on the selects. Well, obviously, we got pictures of guys and sage grouse, but Coyotes, red fox, a lot of deer and elk, right? Yeah. What was really neat though, is since we were transplanting birds there, we actually had males. And you can see the VHF transmitter here on this male. 
this one actually had the rump tail harness. We decided to switch over because we felt like these neckless transmitters might be impacting their behavior a little bit. But these birds are showing up on the Lex within a few days of being re uh, relocated. Another great picture provided by Missy. This is uh, two females. Also, you can see the lower necklace radio collars. So again, it seems like these birds, even though they're in a new environment, they're quickly grouping up focal birds and kind of learning the ropes. So this is a, a newer project conducted by CPW. I don't think anyone talked about it yet. But uh, Dr. Mike Phillips is conducting a demographic study between 2007 and 2010. He monitored 11 different hens in the Maramani population. 20 nests, only four of them hatched. Zero chicks survived for this four year period. So you can see, obviously, our high male count numbers were declining. The cause of predation, we believe, was mostly coyote. So we figured we would try to do aerial gunning for coyotes, try to knock back the coyote population. The control area was just over 56,000 acres. In 2011, with the help of wildlife services, 64 coyotes were killed, 2012-91 coyotes. You can see, kind of opportunistically, other predators or potential predators were taken. So we continue to monitor this population after the permanent control effort. In 2011, 2012, you can see we had 30, 33% of this success. 9% uh, and then it jumped up to 40% chick survival. That's the second year and that's going out to one year survival. Total cost though, 2,600, I'm sorry, 267,000 dollars, but this includes that initial demographic research, uh, the actual predator control effort, and then the post-monitoring. We did have a little blurb post-control efforts. At the same time, the other lex in this area were doing the exact same thing. We didn't see much of an increase. It was still pretty stagnant afterwards. Candidate conservation agreements with assurances. Again, 40 certificates of inclusion. 93,771 acres enrolled. This was the first, the first seven years of my career at Colorado Division of Wildlife. Conservation easements. This is a huge aspect of protecting ghost and sage grouse habitat, securing these populations. Numerous different facilitators and holders of these conservation easements. So if you look at the occupied range of medicine sage grouse in Colorado, 951,000 acres, roughly 405,000 are on private land. And then the easements within occupied habitat, we protected you know, 89,000 acres. If you throw in the state wildlife areas, we've protected almost another 30,000 acres. <coughs> so this is worded just a little bit differently. It has the number of acres by population, the number of acres within occupied range. So again, this jumps it up to 122,000 acres protected under conservation easements. So the Miller Ranch State Wildlife Area, this was initially protected with the conservation easement on the north side of the property. Uh, the Miller family <coughs> decided that they wanted to sell the ranch, and they came, uh, worked with Jay Wynn here locally, and we were able to negotiate actually buying the ranch fee title. 1,604 acres protected. We purchased this back in October of 2007. It protects in my opinion, great A habitat, it does have an active left on it. Uh, I have a, a 
lot of respect for the Miller Ranch because they did have numerous offers on this property. It has great water rights. And one of the developers in the area actually proposed buying this property and creating a golf course. I don't like golf courses. I don't think. <laughs> I'll take views like this on the night. And now these mills have a place to strut for forever. Let's look at North Up Ohio Creek Valley. Other habitat improvement projects, uh, solar wells. We put those in on some of our state wildlife areas to help provide additional sources of water for cattle grazing. Snow fencing for water storage. You may have heard this a couple times over the past couple days. My predecessor, Paul Jones, this is later on in the spring, we're out here looking at the response of the Mountain Shrub community and the Aspen suckers. Gunnison County, a huge partner in this whole collaborative effort. Gunnison County, as you heard from Jonathan Halk, uh, land use resolutions are in place that help educate our, our, uh, our landowners. We do have a permitting process. Every building permit goes across Jim Cochran's desk and is reviewed. Uh, again, this helps just minimize the impacts. We have the landfill mitigation fund in place, which is great for helping with getting some of the smaller research management projects funded. We have a LEC access program it provides limited photography for photographers and authors that need original photos for their books. Uh, David Showalter was one of those photographers a couple years ago that came out. And then uh, a shed antler season here in the Gunnison Basin. That was a paper, an issued paper submitted by Gunnison County to Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission, which created a, a season. So. Starting uh, January 1st through the 14th of March, you cannot pick up shed antlers. So if you find a shed antler on a walk behind Western, you can't pick it up right now. Or, uh, I'll have to have Chris Parmeter chase you down. Starting on the 15th of March, though, after 10 a.m. until the 15th of May, you can pick up antlers. And this was kind of a compromise. Uh, we have quite a few sportsmen in the Gunnison Basin that enjoy this hobby. Um, and so we thought providing this kind of limited opportunity is a good way to still protect sage grouse while they're out there lacking, but also still provide a little bit of access for people who have cabin fever. A great tool that the Gunnison Basin Strategic Committee has de developed. This is our habitat prioritization tool. Uh, this is the tool that Jim Cochran uses every time that application comes across his desk for, uh, for a building permit or ISD permit. We look at the location where that project is, is it in, in tier one habitat? And if it is, quite often that will stimulate you know, an on the ground uh, visit by us. And quite often we're, we're able to find you know, a good compromise, a good solution minimize those impacts, but still allow that landowner to, uh, to move forward with their project. Not always, but uh, I think it's a great opportunity for us, again, to educate these folks and uh, bring them on board. Uh, I think Mike Pelletier's here. This is Mike Pelletier's baby. He brings all these different layers together and somehow brings it so it, it scores one value. It's, you know, helps us determine what that habitat value is. The 11 County Coalition, again, uh, Gunnison County Commissioner Jonathan Houck, who's been a huge leader in this effort, uh, basically bringing some of the success from the Gunnison Basin and you know, spreading it to the other counties. So quite a few other counties have now adopted 1041 regulations, as you heard earlier. Road closures. Road closures are a great way for us to reduce those impacts to grouse during the lighting season. So road closures, 
are in place again from the 15th of March through the 15th of May on public lands. I believe there's, I think it's close to 40 different gates out there that are closed. And this is the collaborative effort again between Gunnison County, BLM, and Forest Service. Education and outreach. This is a, this is something I hope we can bring back to Gunnison Sage Grouse Festival. I think the last time we did it was in 2013. Is that right? A great way to involve the community though and bring in outsiders outside the basin uh, to Gunnison to celebrate this unique bird. <coughs> Obviously we target grade school kids. This is Chris Parmeter, wildlife officer. Again, gotta, gotta teach those kids a little She's not here tonight, but this is my dog, right? Obviously biased. Additional education and outreach. Our wildlife officers, other, uh, other biologists, BLM biologist, Rush Plunage, uh, Trevor, Western State College student. Uh, just great, getting into the grade school and teaching these kids about wildlife conservation. <coughs> so this is a venison sage grouse specimen that unfortunately we lost during one of our trap and transplant uh, efforts. Put the hen into the, the box to be relocated uh, she got nervous, kind of flew into the back of the box and broke her neck. So, uh, what do you do? Donate it to a museum for uh, a nice uh, study skin. I submitted this bird to the Chicago Field Museum. This is uh, the avian curator, Ben Marks, preparing the study skin. To help that study skin, that bird be preserved for many, many years to come. Some of the wildlife photographers that we've had come out, Mount Pathong, great book, Save the Last Dance. <coughs> Dr. Pat McGee was his guide that morning. So what we do is we'll, uh, we'll accept these photographers for a limited photography opportunity, but we work with private landowners so we don't have to disclose the location of a lack on public lands. So uh, thank you to those landowners that provide access wouldn't be really possible to help them. But uh, again, it just provides a great opportunity to get some photos, continue our educational efforts. David Showalter's book, available over here at the table. I should get like some kind of stunner or something. <laughs> okay. Another great book, please check it out over there. Dakin Henderson, he'd uh, he did this wildlife science short video for High Country News. Um, came out with me last spring and we did a sage grouse count together. And uh, probably can't see this, this link, but uh, maybe we can play it later on or something if you're interested. But just a, a great, great video, beautiful scenery. Uh, if you go on YouTube and just search for Gunston Sage Grouse, High Country News will come right up. Habitat restoration, numerous projects, brush management, conifer removal. Again, numerous different parties. Here. Over 6,600 acres have been uh, treated through the EQIP, SGI here, oak brush treatments, pinion juniper removal, wet meadow restoration, reseeding, weed removal, prescribed grazing adjustment. 8,500 acres of conservation easements through the new ASAP in the Grass and Reserve Program have been protected through NRCS. And then over 16,000 acres have had technical assistance conducted on. 34,330 acres enrolled in the Conservation Reserve Program. Most of that down in Duck Creek. 389 different projects between 
2012. This is coming out of our um, Kiowa Parks and Wildlife Habitat Database. I think Marcelo got these numbers from the federal listing. Over 26,000 acres treated. Roughly 2.5% of occupied habitat. There's a project over in the Cerro Summit Cimarron population. Uh, this was a project that Christina Santana conducted before she left. Roughly 500 acres in size. Another one in Dry Creek Basin. If I remember right, this was uh, Jim Garner's tree. 560 acres on private land. Crawford, the BLM, is a tree. Lots of pinyon juniper. 4,000 acres. Over what, this the past five years or so? Doug Lawrence's uh, research, we saw a little bit about this. This is the Crawford population. <coughs> I, think he, I think it was 12 or 13 different grouse. Um, I think it was nine hens, three males, uh, that he uh, fitted with these solar uh, Argos, GPS, PTT satellite transmitters. Other project, numerous projects conducted by the Bureau of Land Management, music area restoration, again the conifer removal, prescribed burning, other sage grass removal projects, kind of mowing sagebrush out of some of these music areas, grazing allotment coordination and monitoring, and then road closures. Again, some of Bill's he likes one rock dam structures. And here's Bill down in the San Miguel working group, San Miguel Basin with the working group. This is over in Crawford. I'm glad to see that this work is really catching on because I, I think that's probably one of the limiting factors here is good quality broodering habitat. So to see us building these structures, it's going to hold that moisture, <coughs> keep that ground saturated a little bit longer. Even if, even if it's just for a couple of weeks, I think it could make a big difference and the survival of these chicks. Different structure, the plug and spread. This has been a, another collaborative project here in Gunnison. Under the consultation of Bill, you can see here, this is out in Kizar Basin. We have a larger in size channel. What we're doing is we're borrowing material here, getting down to like a clay membrane, and then we'll take that clay soil and create a nice plug here, kind of, I, I compare it to an artificial beaver dam. Plugging that up, and then we have these two open bays for that water to spread back out on both sides of the meadow. Getting that return sheet flow. This is a project uh, conducted by Rick Snyderbeck. I'm not sure if Corey was on board yet, but. I, I know he still works with these landowners. You can see these sheet metal check dams allows them to better control the water level in these meadows, get better displacement. Again, getting that water up out of the channel and returning it back to more of a natural sheet flow. Quite a few other projects, 638 acres of wetland enhanced. 3,950 acres of upland habitat, 4.3 miles of riparian habitat. This is a Fish and Wildlife Service partners program for you now. Again, working on that breedering habitat. Obviously good, uh, good waterfowl habitat as well. A lot of different grazing management practices have been tweaked. Prescribed burning, uh, maybe a little more contentious these days, but as you can see, this is a prescribed burn on flat top. Not too hot. 
But uh, it really opened up that sagebrush canopy cover, got it back down to uh, more of the guidelines we're looking for for breeding habitat. Also created those nice little, uh, a nice mosaic open pockets with good herbaceous cover on the ground. Creating some of that real good early brewing habitat. Additional burning. This one was a little bit different. This was actually a sheet grass uh, treatment project through the use of aerial spraying. This is with NRCS, Colorado State Forest Service, private, private landowners, of course, and the Chavanel Conservation District. Sagebrush mulling, where sagebrush is encroaching down in some of these music riparian areas. Getting down in there and just opening it back up. Again, trying to get more of the riparian plant species back. That's John Scott, Christina Santana, and the tractor. Reseeding, reseeding and sagebrush. I'm trying to improve that understory. Quite a few different projects. I wish I uh, was able to get a total number of acres treated for you. But. This is a big one down in Monticello, Utah, on a conservation easement by the Nature Conservancy. Trying to actually restore the sagebrush. And I don't know, is Steve Monson? No? Anyone know who that is? He looks happy with the results. <laughs> Again, the Nature Conservancy, another great partner here. We've got Betsy Neely leading the, the troops coming in to build some rock structures. Bill Zedek here doing his consultation. Lots of volunteers. If I remember right, it's, I think it's over 150 different students and volunteers now that have been involved in this project. So um, besides for the, the change in the vegetation that we're seeing, I'm really happy to be introducing some of these kids trying to develop that land ethic again. Fence markers. Miles of fence markers have been installed. Again, more water developments. Again, trying to get some of those cattle out of the, the wet meadows, the riparian areas, uh, so that they don't have the shearing and trampling down the meadows. But a few of these are funded by the NRCS. More fence markers. Personally, I like to see some of these natural stays being used. I think that helps increase the visibility but also strengthen the fence. Okay, stewardship award. Quite a few folks over the years great individuals here, which kind of leads us into the 2015 Stewardship Award that we're going to give out tonight. Again, I mentioned this, President of the Augusta Stock Growers Association, Bert Guerreri. This was uh, Director Bob Rochide of Cattle Parks and Wildlife, giving him the 2014 Landowner, Landowner of the Year Award to the Stock Growers. Again, for all their guests and sage grouse conservation efforts. And then finally, you know, unfortunately, we've lost some, some dear friends over the years. We've been doing this kind of work for long enough that um, it's unfortunate to, to lose these folks. But Jim Ultraman, he was one of our Colorado Division of Wildlife Biologists, also a pilot. Many of you may be familiar with that story. He actually was stocking fish in high mountain lakes and uh, couldn't pull up in time and went into the side of the mountain and died. Kathy Nickel, uh, BLM, Forest Service Supervisory Biologist out of Durango. Sandy Hage was a BLM ecologist here in Gunnison. Uh, Cliff Coghill, long time wildlife officer. I should probably call him a game warden. But, uh, served for, what was it, Danny, over 
35 years? Longer than that, 40? 40. 40. And as you heard, we recently lost Jim Boyd, NRCUS uh, resource conservationist out of Norwood. And with that, I just want to say sincerely, thank you for all your hard work and effort. Um, let's keep it up. And without further ado, I'd like to play a little video, if it's okay. It's about four minutes long. It's, uh, it's relevant to our recipient tonight for the Stewardship Award. This individual has been just instrumental in helping the crop, the Gunston Basin Climate Local Working Group uh, be developed and our on the ground efforts get accomplished. She's not in this video, but uh, see if you can figure out who it is. This was a video developed by Joe Lewandowski, our Southwest media specialist Colorado kind of Parks and Wildlife. And I, I'll, again, I, I apologize, you're gonna have to listen to me through this video. This is my, my best Bill Z-like imitation, so. <laughs> Habitat. Here's how they work. I'm Nathan Seward. I'm a wildlife biologist in Gunnison, Colorado. Because we're holding more moisture in the system now, 
This is going to provide some excellent cover for venison sage grouse, but also deer and elk uh, winter forage. So we've built over 450 of these simple uh, rock structures over nine miles uh, throughout the Gunnison Basin, uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife in collaboration with our local climate working group led by the Nature Conservancy. Recently, Colorado Parks and Wildlife worked with the Nature Conservancy, wildland restoration volunteers, the U.S. Forest Service, and local landowners on projects in the Gunnison Basin. Consultant Bill Zedike, an expert on small rock dams, helped supervise the projects. I found that we can be very effective using uh, people power to build these. I've been doing this kind of work uh, with volunteers for more than 30 years now. We've built uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of small structures. Although small in scale, these projects will make a big difference for the Gunnison sagebrush, explained Dr. Jessica Young of Western State Colorado University. She's been studying the birds for more than two decades. This is an exciting project. The riparian areas in sagebrush and Gunnison Valley are some of the most critical areas for the species survival. The chicks completely depend on them to be able to get access to invertebrates to grow in their first two or three months and they have to grow fast. So the project that's going on here is going to restore these areas, it's going to bring back riparian vegetation, and that will draw in the insects and the vertebrates that the chicks need. I'm thrilled it's here. For the guns and sage grouse, some piles of rocks are going a long ways. Okay, so tonight's recipient is a senior conservation planner of the Nature Conservancy. Uh, she's worked with the Southwest Climate Change Initiative uh, to provide information and tools to conservation practitioners on climate adaptation in vulnerable landscapes. She's coordinated the Gunnison Basin Climate Change Adaptation Workshop for Natural Resource Managers. Uh, she's facilitating a basin-wide comprehensive vulnerability assessment, developing adaptation strategies and coordinates the wet meadow restoration resiliency demonstration project here in the Gunnison Basin. She also co-leads the Colorado Rear Plant Conservation Initiative, a partnership among 23 organizations and agencies here in Colorado, and the imperiled plants and their habitats. She authored the first Colorado Rare Plant Conservation Strategy. And because of this work, she's received the 2011 Recovery Champion Award from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to conserve endangered and threatened species of fish and wildlife and plants. So please welcome, <laughs> please help me welcome Betsy Neely, the 2015. <laughs>
We have one more presentation to make. First, a speech from Ken. <laughs> well deserved, Betsy. Congratulations. Thanks. I'm Ken Stallnecker. I'm the chair of the Gunnison Basin Sage Route Strategic Committee. I'm here to, to share in the recognition of another individual who's had an a influential uh, effect on Gunnison Sage Grouse conservation in the basin over the last nearly two decades. And he's at a point now in his career where I think he's at a, a bit of a transition point, kind of nearing the tail end, if you will, of that career. And that's Jim Cotton. Get up here, Jim. <laughs> Working group, um, you've heard a good bit about Jim's history over the course of the last couple of days. Uh, he became the Gunnison Sage Grouse, or the uh, Gunnison County Wildlife Coordinator. Um, in 2005, uh, and one of the, the primary um, tasks that Jim set about doing was to stand up the Gunnison Basin Sage Grouse Strategic Committee, which under the direction of the, the uh, Gunnison Board of County Commissioners, which was established to try to bring together a diversity of interests in um, addressing conservation of Gunnison Sage Grouse. Uh, you heard about a number of the, the uh, accomplishments that Jim uh, was responsible for over that time period, um, working with the, uh, the road closures, coordinating with BLM on road closures. You heard about that this morning from Russ. Jim talked yesterday about his work uh, putting, or, uh, working through the, the uh, land use regulations and um, reviewing building permits and so forth. Um, working in an integral manner with the, the uh, effort that um, Betsy has led and that Renee talked about earlier today, kind of creating that bridge between the, the uh, Gunnison uh, working or the uh, climate uh, resilience project with private landowners and allowing a lot of that to get off the ground. I can go on and on and on about the accomplishments that, that Jim has been involved with. Um, essentially serving as the backbone of the Gunnison Basin Strategic Committee over the years. <laughs> I'm going to go on, Jim. You better, you better straighten up there. Um, I think probably, though, in general, one of the main things I'm going to point out is um, Jim's steady influence in the community in terms of um, helping the community to work towards, as Jonathan pointed out earlier today, a culture of conservation surrounding the Gunnison Sage Grouse, as opposed to taking a route where, where we could have said Gunnison Sage Grouse is a dirty word. We, we see it as a, 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 a roadblock to progress in the county. We're not going to do anything about it. We've, we've really rallied around the, the culture of conservation. Um, so I, I think those are a number of positive traits that that uh, Jim has brought. Uh, of all of the positive things, one thing that Jim has, I will say, failed miserably at is retirement. <laughs> this is his second attempt at retirement, and it's not going so well. But we are here to try to help him um, meet his goal, and we are awarding Jim the tail end award in recognition of your de dedication services to the Gunnison Sage Grouse and the community's efforts to sustain it. Um, so thank you, Jim, for everything you've done. And I know Greg wants to say a few words as well. Thanks, Ken. That was, I think Ken did an excellent job with the presentation. Actually, the only reason they had me come up here tonight was to tell an embarrassing story <laughs> about Jim. I'm just kidding. Actually, the, just, Ken did a great job of summing up Jim's accomplishments. But I think what stands out for me over the years in working with Jim is not only did he have an agricultural background and a biological background, 
but he had an ability to reach out to all different groups and all different sorts of people and bring them together and, and reach consensus and move forward. And so that's a wonderful thing, and I think that's a big reason for all the wonderful accomplishments that have taken place in the Gunnison Basin. So without further ado, Jim, congratulations. And we're not going to let you retire that, <laughs> that easily, so thank you. <laughs> good job with this. I mean, and there's colleagues, people I've worked with here for literally 20, 20 years in some cases. And, and uh, so I appreciate it all. I can't, it's not me, it's all of you that makes conservation possible. So thank you very much. And while we're here, I'm glad you're up here. We're losing one of our builders. He decided on a career change. So, thank you, Ken. We appreciate your leadership. He's been the chair of the strategic committee for 10 years. That in itself, and then we want him an achievement. So, yeah, thank you. And those of us you see up here, Ken and Greg and myself and Jim almost, um, were some, of the, were some of the original people on the original working group. And uh, Greg and I are probably going to be the only two original ones once Ken leaves. Thank you. 